More like Saint Tutuis. Do I gotta do a video for this? Hi, and welcome to Cup Check. My name is Steve Dangle, and I do a video after every single Stanley Cup final game. And in this one, the St. Louis Blues win 4-2 over the Boston Bruins in Game 4 of the Stanley Cup final, tying it all up at twos. The St. Louis Blues winning in the Stanley Cup final in St. Louis for the first time for the first time. Ever, ever, ever. Two players I want to call out in particular. I remember heading into the series on the podcast, I said the St. Louis Blues need someone to really step up and be their star. Jaden Schwartz had an amazing first three rounds, but I, I think that both teams that make it to the Stanley Cup Final have at least one good player. Someone else has to step up and be that monster. In Game 4, the Blues had two. Ryan O'Reilly with two goals, he's the easiest to point out, obviously. Only his fourth and fifth goals of the playoffs, if you can believe it. But man, with two assists and playing 29 minutes and 37 seconds in a game that did not even sniff overtime, Alex Petrangelo, wow. Between penalty kill and power play, he played nearly six and a half minutes and he played over 23 minutes at even strength alone. And I think those are two performances out of Blues players that even Bruins fans can respect. I also want to shout out Vladimir Tarasenko for scoring a goal and getting six shots on goal for the second time this series, but I feel like they may not like him as much. Let's talk about the game. So, the St. Louis Blues, they win a game in Boston, and they steal home ice advantage away from them, and they have high hopes for Game 3. And the Bruins dunk their head in the toilet. Game 4, obviously they want to be a little bit better. But it doesn't matter! Game 4, the building is rocking! Everyone's going up! Brett Hall is on one! And there's a lot of energy in the building, but a lot of it is nervous energy. And not the normal kind of excited that we're in the Stanley Cup Final energy, the, mm, we got killed last game energy. Early goal would be nice. Right away, first minute of the game, Blues sustain pressure in the Bruins zone. David Perron with the puck in the corner works it up to Alex Petrangelo with the point. He doesn't get an assist on this one but again, everything seems to go through him when it comes to the Blues. He sends it across to Vince Dunn who is finally back in this game and making an immediate impact for the Blues. He throws it on. Zach Sanford who's battling in front gets a piece of it. Ryan O'Reilly comes up with the loose puck. And have you seen Ryan O'Reilly's stick? Did you see that feature on it? And I think it was 31 thoughts. Most of the blade is completely straight. But at the very end I, I can't even make my knuckle do what his stick there there that's what it no stop stay there is it legal uh they know about it so i guess so flies around the ruins net duke Ras can't get over in time and he uses that weird little hook stick to score a wraparound goal and put the blues up in the first minute one to nothing. So huge for the Blues. So huge for Ryan O'Reilly, obviously. Because we all know the guy's an amazing two-way forward. He's a leader on the team. And it's not like he's had a bad playoffs, for sure. 16 points in 22 playoff games heading into Game 4. Obviously hasn't been bad offensively. The problem is, only three of those points were goals. He's still finding other ways to produce and contribute, obviously. But he almost scored 30 goals this season. He's got to put the puck in the net himself a little bit more. And he does right away in this one. And again, Vince Dunn returns to this game. They got 13 minutes out of him. I wonder if that's going to go up as the series continues. And you know who led all Blues forwards in ice time in this one? He played 19 minutes and 32 seconds, led all Blues forwards by nearly a full minute. Oscar Sundquist returning from suspension. I should say, returning from suspension in the series. Matt Grizzlick, coincidentally, not back yet. Chara slowly getting broken down in this series, in this game. Interesting factor as this series wears on, the Blues appear to be receiving reinforcements, while the Bruins are getting even more and more banged up. Of course, Tuka Rask is still keeping them in every game and giving them a chance to win every single game. And while guys are out of the lineup or even playing hurt, other Bruins are stepping up and and probably the biggest example of that is Charlie Coyle. Braden Shen, Rock Stanton, Heinen, and ah, everyone goes nuts, but the play's not over. Zidane Chara collects a loose puck at the blue line and he takes it along the half wall. Now the subplot to this, there are two players in front. Marcus Johansson is in a little bit of a battle with Jay Bomeister. If you're the Blues, you don't like that there's a Bruin in front, but at least you have a guy that's there. Well, what happens is Marcus Johansson slowly backs away and he lures Bomeister with him, opening up the whole net front. Charlie Coyle sneaks in behind Jaden Schwartz, Daniel Chara puts it on, there's a rebound, and Charlie Coyle cleans it up, and it's a 1-1 game. Coyle, playoff rental, his ninth of the playoffs. And a little bit like the first period in the last game, the story coming out of that game was all oh, Bennington should have had this, he should have had that. The early goals, 
Bennington was there, he needed his teammates to help him out. So there, we got a competitive 1-1 game, a tie game. Now again, whoa, there's that anxious little energy there. The Blues can head into first intermission with a tie game, and it would be an enormous improvement on the previous game, but boy, would it just feel so much better to have outplayed the Bruins in the first and have the lead. Well, here's a little bit of luck for you. Braden Shen's along the wall, he's got the puck, but he's not even facing the play, and he's got four Bruins on him. Actually, at one point, he has the attention of all five. Look at this. This play turned into a goal for the Blues somehow. And this won't show up on the score sheet, but this little play is what saves the whole thing. Connor Clifton gonna intercept the puck in the slot. Jaden Schwartz with the stick lift. Puck makes it to the point to Alex Petrangelo. You don't want him to have the puck. He sneaks in. A little bit of a toe drag on Marcus Johansson. Puts it on. Stop, but there's a rebound. Vladimir Tarasenko, another guy who's really starting to take over. And the Blues head into first intermission with a 2-1 lead as a result. Buddy, you're out shooting 13-9, you're leading 2-1. Is this the same Blues team from Game 3, really? Good hustle from Braden Chen, but really he just throws it behind himself with a hope and a prayer. It's Jaden Schwartz that makes it all happen with that little stick lift. And, interesting little factor about that first period, Craig Berube complaining about the officiating, and I mean, Blues with 14 penalties through the first three games, I guess I get it. Just so funny that in the first period, the Blues and Bruins combined for zero penalty minutes. Hmm, I'm sure that suits the Blues just fine. The way the Bruins power play has been operating, I'm sure the Blues would like to play the whole series at 5-on-5. Five five. A few minutes into the second, Charlie Coyle gets the game's first penalty with a high stick. The Bruins kill it. Very shortly after that, Colton Pareko puck over the glass! You pull your hair out! And the Blues, some might argue miraculously, kill that one off. And then with a tightly contested second period, no one really able to get footing, no one able to score a goal... Karma happens. Connor Clifton gets an illegal check to the head penalty out of Vladimir Tarasenko, and you cannot check someone in the head. That is a terrible thing that needs to be taken out of the game, am I right? Mm. Watch the replay. Oof! The cell job, Vladdy! I saw people calling that, oh, professional wrestling fake. No, 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 no. Professional wrestling, their whole thing is they make it look real. Tarasenko has Clifton skate by him, and then it's... Oh! A problem with the super slow motion cameras is you don't understand how much that slows reality down. There can be a hit and then the reaction seems late to you. But these cameras go so slowly that it actually does take a second for your brain to go ow and then you react. So with these cameras I see a lot of people call diving and I don't think it's fair at all. I don't think it's diving. This is Diving! I don't know if there's enough proof for the National Hockey League to issue Tarasenko a fine for embellishment, but they probably oughta. That was terrible. But the universe has a funny way of evening things out. On the ensuing penalty kill, Brad Marchand, having a bit of a rough series, manages to chip it to Patrice Bergeron who catches it in his glove. All of a sudden he's got a two-on-one with Brandon Carlo with him and Vladimir Tarasenko is the only blue back. And this is Patrice Bergeron, man. He knows he's got Carlo wide open and I think he might even be thinking pass. The problem is, if you watch the replay, when he drops the puck from his glove, he can't get it to settle flat. So, what do you do when it won't settle? Knuckle puck time! Whack! He cracks it at Jordan Bennington, darn near beats him, but there's a juicy rebound. And Brandon Carlo is not gonna miss that one. Man, his rookie season as a Boston Bruin, 82 games played, zero in the playoffs. The following season, 76 games played, zero in the playoffs. Has a 72 game regular season this year, he actually gets to play in the playoffs and he plays in 20 games and he doesn't score at all in game 21 is blackjack the blues could have gotten a two goal lead on a power play they shouldn't have even had in the first place and instead the boston bruins tie it with a shorty now i'm not gonna lie as an objective outsider good. It's the worst when a play like that has an effect on the game. Especially when the team that benefited from the embellishment ends up getting a goal and they win. So Boston would have lost and there's two days off before game five. What do you think we would have been talking about the entire time? Instead the Bruins tie it with a shorty. They lost the game but they didn't lose because of this. So we can all have some peace. Sort of. Probably not. The other play in this game where there was a little bit of embellishment from the Blues but it didn't lead to anything. 
Marshawn and Bennington. Marshawn skating by Bennington and he hooks Bennington's goalie pad on his left leg and he turns it around a bit and Bennington! It's like that commercial, I fall in and I can't get up! But for everyone saying, oh, Bennington diver, I mean, yeah. But in this situation, him and Marshawn deserve each other, okay? It's another example of Marshawn being a cheap little jerk and Jordan Bennington decided to be a cheap little jerk right back. Two guys on opposing teams trying to create an advantage for their team in the Stanley Cup final. Call me shocked. There were two embellishments by the Blues, yes, but neither of those most egregious ones led to a goal for the Blues. I think we can drop it. Well, we can drop it as an excuse for why the Bruins lost. If you want to use it to make fun of them, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Oh, right, I did want to talk about the third period. Just two minutes in, Blues get a power play. You can pull ahead again. Nothing doing against the Bruins. Tuka was sharp in this one. Shortly after that's killed off, Jay Bomeister with a high stick on Charlie Coyle. Oh, the Blues! But the Bruins' terrifying power play was not that in this game. I know they only got two opportunities to work, which is a stark contrast to games three, two, or one. But while on the penalty kill, Jordan Bennington only had to face one Boston Bruins shot all night. He had to face three while the Blues had the power play, and one of them went in! It's over halfway through the third period, and the Bruins only have three shots. They weren't able to take advantage of that power play opportunity, they didn't get very much done at five on five, and the Blues finally cracked them. The Boston Bruins managed to clear the zone and get a line change, but it's a little choppy. The Bruins get out there with numbers, but they're not quite set up. Alex Petrangelo carries the puck in, and sort of like Bergeron on the shorty, he just says, I'm just gonna clap it on net and see what happens. Tuka Rask makes the initial save, but again, juicy rebound. I don't even know if the thing touched the ice. Ryan O'Reilly with that weird beaver paddle stick, whack! His second of the game puts the Blues up by one, but this is Boston, they bend, don't break. There's nine and a half minutes remaining. And in those nine and a half minutes, one shot. One. The Bruins had four shots in the third period as a whole, which is bad, but at least it was tied. Like, it's one thing if you're getting outplayed when the game is tied, but usually score effects go in your favor. Hey, if you're the team that is losing, you get more shots, because that's how it works. That's just how it works for some dumb reason. Final nine and a half minutes ago, in game four of the Stanley Cup final, a game in which you were losing, the Bruins, one shot. One. And again, Alex Petrangelo is a huge part of that. He gets an assist on the eventual game winner. He plays nearly half an hour, and the Bruins are held to just 23 shots. The one shot Bennington did face, he juggled, and there was almost a rebound, and Petrangelo had to like give back as the RKO. But that's all they muster in the dying moments. Braden Shen steals the puck in the neutral zone, fires it into the empty net. That's the insurance marker. The Blues double up the Bruins 4-2. Have the third periods been the best of any recent playoff series? They both get mean and serious, and it's great hockey. Well, getting mean and serious is great and all, and it adds to the drama, but the Blues dominated the Bruins in this third period. I didn't see it as that way at all. <laughs> Actually, in this series, the first periods have been the ridiculous ones. Fast starts, teams getting the lead, teams blowing the lead, teams coming back. I mean, two teams not liking each other by the end of a game in the Stanley Cup final is pretty par for the course, I'd say. If Chara, Bergeron, and Marchand were Pokemon, what would they be? Chara would be Gyarados. He started out as this adorable Magikarp in 1996 when he was picked in the third round. Aww. But he was developed properly and now all these years later he's this taller than everything destroyer of worlds. Patrice Bergeron would be Venusaur because while he is incredibly good at offense his defense is actually the best part of his game. And if you need him to he can use cut. Brad Marchand is Doug Trio because he attacks you in an effective, underrated and annoying way. When you attack him back he disappears. And when you're mad at he just starts to look like a giant pile of sh that is it for this one thank you very much for watching click like if you like this video click subscribe if you really liked it tell all your friends hey i made a leafs video yesterday why don't you go ahead and watch that and also i'm gonna finally show you a graphic about the book tour soon uh keep an eye on my twitter for that steve underscore dangle